Good morning. I want to take just a moment. This is graduation uh, Sunday for our kids going uh, to new levels. And I just wanted to introduce to you uh, three of the people, of the people that are making this happen. Uh, my wife, Susan. Jules, uh, her assistant. Molly, who is uh, overseeing uh, the junior high and high school. Uh, and so today is a special day that Molly's going to be getting kids, and we'll see how well that happens. You know, when they get teenagers, it's some, there's a shift. And so she and Brad have been doing that, and, and so Susan and Jules, we wanted you to see them. If, are any of you here that you work with the kids once a month? or Lift your hand. Stand up. Would you please stand up? Would you give all of these wonderful people a hand? Thank you. Uh, I just wanted you to see them. I wanted you to know them. And... Uh, just know that they're giving a lot of their time, energy, and skill to your children. So thank you, ladies. Do I need to say anything else? Okay, good. Our children are already gone. They're running the, the zoo. So stand with me. Hold your Bibles up high. Welcome all of you watching online. Uh, hold them up. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, just want to take a moment and remember all the men and women who've given their life uh, for our country. Uh, some of you... Uh, probably our family members of those uh, somewhere in your lineage that did that. And today is a day that we remember them. Tomorrow, obviously, honor uh, their commitment and sacrifice to the freedoms that we still somewhat enjoy. And it's a tragedy that I have to say that, but uh, we're still fighting for those freedoms today. And so <clears throat> I don't want you to ever quit. <clears throat> uh, we've been doing this series entitled Do Not Disturb. Please do not disturb. And uh, the reason for this is I was praying one day and I, I realized there were things in my life uh, and in the world and in the lives of many people uh, that disturb our peace, our joy, our faith. Uh, they just disturb us. And, and if we have a disturbed life or we're living a disturbed life, we're not living our best life. So my goal is to kind of uh, present to us some ways uh, to keep peace in our lives, to keep joy in our lives in the midst of chaos, division, turmoil that's going on in the world, that we maintain a, a mind that is renewed. And, and we renew our mind by the washing with the water of God's word. And so it's so important that the Word of God gets in here and stays in here every day. One person said one time, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in it. And, and, and cluttering your thought life with things that are not productive, that are not fruitful, that are not helpful. And so it is very, very important that we guard our hearts and our minds and uh, understand that God's grace is more than sufficient in the world and in our lives and we have to pull on that. In Luke chapter 15, if you want to turn there, uh, it's one of the most powerful stories in my opinion in the Bible because this is a story that is kind of metaphorical that that the father represents Father God, and then there are two sons, and there's a tremendous amount of wealth. And one son got tired of living on the farm and being a part of the family and decided he wanted to go do his own thing. Some of us have been there. And rather than his father saying, absolutely not, uh, I'm going to punish you, uh, you're not getting any inheritance. You're not getting any money. You're not getting any help. Here's what the father says. 
There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Do you notice he didn't say, would you consider it, please? Would you think about it? Could I have it? He just said, I want my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, this is a thought that I have never seen prior to this sermon. The older son got the same share as the younger son who was going to take off and leave. I often thought <clears throat> as I read this that um, the younger son got his, but since the older brother was staying on the farm, I just kind of assumed that he just someday would get his. But <clears throat> on this particular day, it was divided up. And as we know, it goes on to tell us that the younger son went and squandered what he had been given. He finds himself in a pig pen, eating what pigs would eat. And in that moment, the Bible says he came to his senses. He had a, an epiphany, a moment where he realized even the servant's on the farm where I came from, eat better than I do. And the Bible tells us that he began to rise and move toward the place that he had left. Now, what would make anybody think this is going to be possible? You, you basically not only squandered what your father had given you, that he had worked hard for, that you didn't deserve. But by virtue of your birth or your birthright, you're going to get, which is really interesting, because in these days, the oldest son was heir to everything. But the father cut it in half for the younger son who was going to squander it and appear to not appreciate it and for a moment didn't but decided that he would go back to the Father. Now, think about the courage that this would take, the humility that this would take after you, you messed everything up. He trusted that his Father would at least accept him back. You see, he had a revelation of grace that most of us don't have. We crawl back. But it says he was walking back to the farm and don't know exactly how long he was gone, but let's just say it was a year. The father never took his eyes off of his son. He wasn't there physically physically. But his heart, his mind was prepared to welcome the rebel home. And he didn't say, and this is where a lot of us look at God and think God is like us. In other words, we have created God in our image, in our likeness, in our thoughts, in our ways. And, and you would think that the father would say, well, I'm going to let you back. But, but here are the stipulations. Here's what you got to do. You've got to earn everything. My trust back. It's going to take you time. You, you've, you've got to go through rehabilitation. We have so grossly misunderstood who God is in this day. We don't operate in grace. Not as churches, not as Christians. We don't operate in grace. We operate in judgment and punishment. And there is a different in, difference in punishment and discipline. I believe in discipline. I don't believe in punishment. Discipline says when someone does something wrong, you give them direction and help them back to the place that they need to be. Punishment says I want you to suffer. I don't care if you learn anything or not. You'll never do it again because you suffered. Yeah, you will if you don't learn. That's what discipline is. And that's how come Jesus called those who followed him disciples. He was teaching them disciplines. And so the son's walking up this dusty road. And the father looks down the road at a distance. And I don't know whether very few people traveled that road. 
But for some reason, it was like he had this sense that it was his son. And rather than telling the hands, look, I want all of you to gather around. I'm going to make him apologize in front of everybody, especially come over here, older brother. Come here. I'm going to make him apologize and kiss your feet. The father immediately says, hey, 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 go, go kill the fatted calf. Oh, and the robe that, uh, that, that was custom made in anticipation that this day would come. Oh, oh yeah, and, and, and go to the jeweler. Uh, I've been, I had this ring made, and I had him put it in the safe because it's so expensive, so extravagant that, that I've been waiting. I know the size of my, his finger might have shrunk a little bit because he probably hadn't eaten well, but go, go get the ring. We'll have it sized later. Oh, oh, yeah, and I had some custom crocodile sandals made just for him. I know the size of his foot because he was grown when he left. I'm sure his foot hadn't grown any, so the shoe's going to be great. He, and, and so the father welcomes him, not because he had, and please don't misunderstand this. I'm not trying to cheapen this, but we don't read I mean, we do hear the son say, you know, Father, I don't even deserve to be treated. I mean, he, he repented. He turned to the Father and he acknowledged his wrong. But the Father didn't even spend time having a conversation with him. He immediately began to prepare a celebration and in the midst of doing that, there was only one person that we know of in this story that was angry, and that was the religious older brother. Now, remember, the older brother got his cut and still lived on the farm, still enjoyed everything the father owned. You see, religious people have a hard time with grace. The older brother should have hugged him and wept and said, I'm so glad you're here. But we live in a fallen world that is filled with judgment, punishment. I'll get you back. You don't deserve. See, none of us deserve the grace that is extended to us today. God's grace is extended to us. And, and, and so we, we have to be willing to embrace it. You see, the older brother had never understood or tapped into the grace of the Father because he was the oldest, and culture and religion made him the automatic heir to the farm. So he never really grasped it because he's thinking, just by virtue of the birth order, I get everything. So he didn't appreciate it. Many people who grow up in church and they're taught the rules and regulations and they do a pretty good job of keeping them, think that they deserve whatever God has because they've just been so wonderful. Some of you have, in your mind, really have barely ever sinned. Because to you, the little gossip that you have, the little attitude that you project, that's really not sin. That's just humanity. No, you're a sinner. See, we, we, we categorize sin, and, and certainly the consequences of some sin are greater than other sins, but the reality is sin is sin. And the older brother acted like he deserved whatever it was that, that he was supposed to get. He had nothing to do with it. He had nothing to do with being the firstborn. It just happened. Oftentimes, older believers lose sight of grace because of our position in the church or at work, thus we forget the place from where we've come. Like the older brother, we depend merely on punctuality and work performance and bide our time until the father dies off and then the farm is ours. God, however, desires for us to have more than the farm. He desires that we help others have their farm. You know, 
oftentimes we love people based on how they perform, what they do for us. And instead of realizing that we are called, regardless of how others treat us, we're called to believe the best, pray for the best, and love the most. As a matter of fact, some people who deserve the least need the most. They need to feel a love in the midst of their darkness, a light shining into that darkness that says we believe in you before you show us a reason to believe in you. That's what grace does. I believe in you before I see one reason I ought to believe in you. When you start believing in people who don't believe and don't believe in themselves and you start treating them in a way that they know they don't deserve, it gets their attention. The younger son knew he did not deserve his place that he had left. All he wanted to do was be a servant. That was it. But the father, in this case, in the story, being like God, says, I love you. Again, religious people hate this message. Preaching a grace message is probably harder than preaching a message on money or faith. Because grace is something so foreign to the fallen mind that it's very difficult for us to exercise the grace that the Father exercises toward us. Because we've got it figured out that people need to suffer a little bit. Let me tell you something. This boy had suffered more than any of us could ever imagine. He didn't need more suffering. He needed more grace. You're not in a pig pen and not suffering. You're not eating what the pigs are eating and not suffering. You're suffering. Those of you who have wandered away from God, you've suffered enough. I don't need you to come to church and and us put more suffering on you. The reason you're coming to church is because you've suffered enough and you're looking for somebody to tell you it's going to be okay. We embrace you. We love you. And religious people hate this. Well, how can you do that? They've been living like the devil for 10 years. Yeah, and let me tell you something. They feel the devil, and they felt him for the last 10 years. The last thing they need is a church to punish them even more. You know, many people say, well, you know, uh, we don't let lost people really, once they get born again, there's a period of time before we let them serve I'll throw you into serving the day you say amen to Jesus. Because the way you get too closer to God is serving God and serving others. Well, you know, I'm, I'm afraid they'll misrepresent us. If you're a mosaic, you can't misrepresent anything. I can promise you that right now. You know, I, I mean, it, it, it's, we, we are so, we are so repulsed by things that we think are so devastating and wrong that, that we really, in church, it's almost like we shift gears. And, 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 and I'm not trying to be crass, I'm not, but we're living in a world today that's so different than the world I grew up in. And, and I, I know what the Bible says, and I get all that, but people who have cursed for 20 years are not going to quit in 20 minutes. There's a really good chance that you'll hear uh, language in our lobby that you might not hear in a religious church. I'm just being polite at 11. I might say it differently. But I'm telling you that as a pastor, we've run a lot of people off because they come in. They just can't stop immediately. And, and, and we they feel our judgment. I'm going to tell you, the youngest son did not feel any judgment from the father. I, I can see the father with tears of joy coming down his face. His son smells like a pig. He looks dirty. He's filthy. He's rough. He squandered it on prostitutes and wild living. And the father didn't go, yeah, right. The father said, let's clean him up and treat him like we've always treated him. And it's not going to get easier because the world's perspective of the church, unfortunately, is is somewhat accurate. 
It really is. They look and they look at us and they say, if I go there, they're just going to judge me. They're not going to love me. They're going to judge me. And quite frankly, they feel like they ought to be judged. When in reality, the Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment. I'll say it again and again, and, and I every now and then I cringe, but I'm getting more comfortable with it. We need to love the hell out of people. See, you don't even know how to respond to that. See, we get caught up in things in our minds without realizing the impact of those words right there. I'm not saying it as a cheap curse word. I'm saying when I got born again, there was enough hell in me to fill a community. I needed somebody to love that out of me. I didn't need somebody to tell me it was there. I knew it was there. That's why I came to the church. Could the church please help me? They didn't know what to do with me. Matter of fact, I was blessed because they were afraid of me. They left me alone. I was the only guy with long, curly hair down in my back when I had hair. I think all those perms is what, what caused me to lose it. But this wonderful thing called grace sees beyond our own inheritance into bringing others into their inheritance. I have to see beyond my comfort level. I'm uncomfortable with some things, but I overcome those because I realize if I look at somebody with shock when they say something, I have people say, oh, I shouldn't say that in church. I said, that's ah, okay. I mean, it's almost like it's... And I, I love the house of God, but the house of God really is different than what we've made it. It's, it's not a place where you, you walk into the doors and all of a sudden you're transformed. And, and you don't say the things you say on the curb. <laughs> oh, I'm in the house now. I can't say it. Well, you said it five minutes ago right when you were getting ready to come in. It's almost like God goes, oh, wow. There's this invisible line that says I can't be me. I've got to be somebody else. And, and we're all going from glory to glory. We're all moving in that direction. We're, we're, we're not done. And we won't be done until he comes back. So we have to understand that all of those who serve in the church, we can't become the older brother and talk to God like, well, I think I deserve a little more now because I've been faithful. Well, I'm glad you've been faithful. But think about it this way. I'm being faithful so I can help others be faithful. I'm not being faithful to get a yes and amen from the God. From God, I'm being faithful because I want others to see what faithfulness produces. It produces a life of peace, undisturbed. A life of joy. A life that is different than when I was living outside grace. I, I know a guy who wrote a book on on grace and a bunch of us knew him and a friend of mine started reading it and he's uh, he's big in the Christian world and after about the first chapter he actually called the guy and said you know what this book stinks because he said you're attaching works to grace you talk about grace in the first chapter but in the second chapter you start acting like if you don't do these things then the first chapter doesn't apply It's either grace or it's not. Like I said last week, you can't be barely saved. Somebody said, well, I'm barely born again. Well, usually it's the religious people, well, they're barely saved. I can tell by the way they act. You're either saved or you're not. There's no such thing as barely saved. What's barely saved look like that you still cuss and you're an idiot, but you're in there. Yeah, it's like sliding into home plate. I'm going to slide right under the gates. There won't be anybody barely saved and barely going to heaven. It's like Jesus closing the gates. Hold it, I see some stragglers. <laughs> like the airlines do. We're closing the gates 15 minutes before. I've been there where it was 16. They wouldn't let me on. Or 10 minutes, whatever it is. That's not how it's going to work with Jesus. It's not like, well, some of y'all barely made it. I'm telling you, there are going to be some people in heaven just to test you. You're going to be right there at the gate. They're, they were my, they're coming. Oh God. 
I'm not sure. Honey, are, do we really want to stay here? Hell yeah. <laughs> now, I know you're shocked. And that's a part of the reason because I want you to get this. We are worried about things we should not be worried about. We're talking about things we shouldn't be talking about. We're treating people in ways we shouldn't treat people. All in the name of, well, we're Christians and we're really saved. But you're barely saved. Which means you get a little pepper of grace. You don't get all the grace. You just get a pepper of grace. Listen, I've been born again a really long time. And I need the grace of God today like I did July 17th, 1977. Matter of fact, I may need it more because a lot of people don't come to church because the Bible says to him who knows the right things to do and does not do it to him is sin. The more you know, the more you potentially sin. It's amazing. I know that I'm supposed to love my neighbor as I love myself, but sometimes I don't love me, and I certainly can't love them if I don't love me. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. I don't want to forgive sometimes. I want you to pay. You feel me? No, there are times I wish I didn't, and I say, God, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to be this way. Could you please give me the grace to forgive? And, and the lack of forgiveness, will you please give me the grace to cover my lack? I need grace. And after this sermon, I probably really need grace. Not just from God, but from you. But this is going to get stronger as I get older because this next generation is not coming into the church that you and I came into. They're, they're not going to come in because they don't see it that way. And if you're not careful, we'll judge the next generation right out of worshiping God. I never forget when my son was in college, I, he and I went to a movie. And I won't use the exact word because that would probably really be crossing over. But this movie had a lot of gratuitous bombs in it. That was a tip. So after the movie, I'm a dad, and I'm, I'm raising my kids in church, and I'm a father, and I'm, I'm sitting there in this movie, and I'm really, really very uncomfortable. But I thought, I'm going to stick it out. And, and my my son, is, he's so smart. I, he, I have such a high level of respect for him. And I got in the car, and being the good Christian preacher father I am. <laughs> but in that moment, I had lost all my mental faculties on how to address this. So I thought, rather than say anything, I'll ask a question. I said, what did you think about all those? I said, you know, they, they, they're just throwing these things around, you know. And he looked at me, and this is, and I I, I'm still processing this, and this is 15 years old or longer. And he said, Dad, he said it's a word that somebody gave a definition to. Well, he was smarter than me because it took me a while. I'm still trying to figure that out. But I realized what he was saying is it wasn't as offensive to him as it was to me. And I could easily say that's because I'm a mature Christian and you're barely saved. Because that's what we do. But what he was saying, it didn't land on him the way it landed on me. And let me say this to you. If you expect everybody to feel the way you feel about something, you will miss the opportunity to have a relationship with someone who might actually elevate you and teach you something when you think you're teaching them something. I have learned more from my children than I have in the first two years of college because they see things differently. They're living in a different day, in a different culture, in a different era than how I was brought up. I mean, I ate more lava soap than I used on my body. You talk about abuse. You said, what? I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. Now, if you've never had that happen... You have not grown up in my era. That was back in the day when belts and soap were rightfully used for other things. You go to jail for 
putting soap in your kid's mouth today. And it still didn't help because when I got older and she couldn't catch me, I was doing everything I did when she was washing it. (laughs) Now, I'm not suggesting that she was wrong to try to correct me and put me on the right track, but what I am saying is that in order for us to see the fruit of our Christianity, we have to allow other people who have yet to bear fruit to still be loved and have grace so that they will bear fruit. You'll never hear an orange tree grunting. (laughs) It's like, okay, I got it. Here comes an orange. It just bears fruit. If you treat it right, you nourish it right, not if you go out there and say, you better give me some oranges or I'm going to cut your first limb off. And if you don't bear another, I'll cut another limb off. And then eventually we'll get to your trunk and you won't even be an orange tree anymore. <laughs> Yet that's how people treat people. If you don't do right, we're going to cut you off. We're not, we're not going to have anything to do with you. You're not, you can't serve in the church. Now, you say, well, that's a risk. Yeah, sure, it is a risk. I've hired more ex-cons than most churches have in their church throughout my lifetime. Why? Because everybody deserves a chance. Everybody deserves a chance. And I know that that goes against the grain of a lot of people who are afraid, and and I get it. You know, I, I one previous church, I, I had one of the ex-cons actually steal money. I caught him stealing money. I sat down with him. I said, you know, if I call the law, you're going back to prison. I said, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fire you, but I, I will see you on the front row of church every Sunday. Is it a deal? In other words, I'm going to incarcerate you into the house of God. I'm not running you off. I'm putting you on the front row, Jack. And you know what? He walked it out, and he's still free today. He didn't go to jail. We just said we believe in you. But you're going to be in church, and you're going to sit, and you're going to listen, and you're going to grow. Now, I'm not trying to demonstrate, but I know what grace can do. Not not everybody responds to it that way. But it doesn't mean that we quit just because a few people decide not to respond the way we want them to respond. Always believing the best, always doing our best. And and I, I've tried it both ways. I lived a lot of my life the other way. Suck it up, buttercup. And, and and really trying to coach people to their best instead of loving people to their best. And there's nothing wrong with coaching. I have friends who are life coaches and they're doing a lot of good. But If you're coaching without love, all the instructions you give somebody typically won't do any good. And if they do, they won't understand what propelled them to their success. And they will be mean, successful people. But you love people into their success. And they will love people after you into their success. And it will continue. This is called grace. But you have to stay full of God. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. He lives in Sacramento, uh, California. Pastors, he's retired now and got a lot of wisdom. And every now and then I talk to him. He said that he's still doing some consulting for other pastors because now he's retired and he's older. And he said he got in his wife's car and he said, now, you got to know my wife and I know his wife. (laughs) He said her car is a gas guzzler. And he said, so I got in it to drive, and I'm driving down the road about 30, 30 miles away. He said, I noticed that the car had less than a quarter of a tank of gas. And he said, I kept thinking all the way, so I'm going to run out of gas. I'm going to run out of gas. So he finally called his wife. He said, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with your car. I've only got this much gas. And he said, uh, I, am I going to make it? She said, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. She, she said, I drive that car all the time. You'll be fine. He said, but all the way, 30 miles, 
He was distracted and disturbed, thinking, I'm not going to make it. It's not full enough. And a lot of us are living our lives distracted and disturbed because we're unsure if we can make it. And I go on to say this. This is why we have to be full of God. If you're full of God, there will be no room to be full of the cares of this life. So if you get full of God, things that used to bother you won't bother you anymore. Because you'll understand God's got this. Grace has got this. I'm going to be fine. And, And my friend was being diligent. But he said what bothered me was the whole way I couldn't enjoy my drive because I kept thinking I'm not going to make it. Many people don't enjoy their Christianity because they keep thinking, I'm not going to make it. I'm not good enough. I can't do enough. I can't be enough. And you're distracted and you're disturbed because you're depending on you instead of depending on him. You can make it. You're a drug addict right now. You're loving God. And people, religious people say, you don't love God. If you love God, you wouldn't be a drug addict. I know some drug addicts who love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they're trying to get free. And they need people like you and me to say, you can do this. You can make it. You can fill yourself with God. You can overcome this. But we quit on them and say, well, when you quit doing drugs, when you give that up, No, no, you have to look and say, look, I'm not saying you support it, you endorse it. I'm not even saying you let them move in with you. Because some of you right now are going, is he telling me I got to take them in? I'm not telling you what to physically do. I'm telling you how to spiritually respond. God will tell you what to do, how to help, how to to help them be successful, how to help them have their own farm and be blessed. This thing called grace is a very complex, complicated thing in Christianity. And most people want to judge. They want to throw you under the bus. I'm going to close with a scripture that's not anywhere to be found in my notes. Give me a minute here. This scripture probably changed my life. I'm going to read it um, out of the Amplified Bible. It says, brethren, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit, should set him right and restore and reinstate him without any sense of superiority and with all gentleness, keeping an attentive eye on yourself, lest you should be tempted also. That right there says it all. Three steps, set him right. Restore him, reinstate him. It doesn't say punish him, remove him, get rid of him, distance yourself from him or her. It says this is what you're to do by the Spirit of God. And we suck as churches doing that. Just saying. And we better get better at it because we're going to keep getting opportunities. In this church... We're not going to throw people under the bus. We're going to give them a seat on the bus. So this week, I want you to think, what are the areas of my life where I realize I have a tendency to judge instead of a tendency to give grace? We all have those areas that we don't see that are blind spots. And again, I'm not saying if you have a wayward child, I'm not saying that you endorse or even support their behavior, but you support them. You go get them. You take them to eat. You throw them, you throw them some help. You say, but they don't deserve it. Neither do you. I've learned more, like I said, from how to love through my children than anything else. And then after that, the church. 
people who are mean, people who are hateful. Boy, everything in our flesh wants to be right back at you, baby. But the reality is, that's not God. God's not a gotcha God. I got you. I got you back. No, he actually, he's got you. But he's not a get it back. That father didn't say, son, you're going to have to work a year. You're going to live in the bunkhouse with everybody else. You're going to get the same dirty, filthy clothes, and you're going to go out, and you're going to farm. After a year, we'll talk. He didn't say that. He immediately put him right back where he was, saying, you've come back. You've acknowledged that you don't deserve it. Now I'm going to give you everything back. That's Christianity. So, hopefully, in some way, this introduction to grace will help us all to check our attitudes, check our judgment, where sin abounds, grace does more abound, mercy triumphs over judgment, love never fails. That's the mantra of Mosaic Church, love, grace, and mercy. And that ought to be the mantra of all of our lives. We're going to walk in love. We're going to extend grace. We're going to give mercy. Some people will abuse it. Some people will lose it. Some people will be thankless. It doesn't change our response, nor does it change God's. God gets abused every day. There are people who say he doesn't exist. There is no such thing as God. And God still loves them. And he wants them to turn to him. And when they do, he's not going to say, it's about time, dummy. That's not God. Christianity is more challenging than religion. Religion says here are 10, 15, 20, or if you're a Pharisee, 600 plus rules to follow. And if you'll just follow these, uh, you know, it's going to work out. Probably not. Christianity says most of the time, do something that doesn't feel like you want to do it and do it anyway. I don't want to forgive, forgive. I don't want to love, love. I don't want to give grace, give it anyway. I'd rather judge, they're wrong. But I say, I say mercy. See, there are so many paradoxes in, in our walk, in our faith, that we need to demonstrate in order to experience our own relationship with God. Because whatever you sow, you reap. The minute you start sowing grace, you'll start experiencing grace. The minute you start loving others, you'll start receiving love from others. The minute you start showing mercy, you'll start experiencing mercy. But if you're asking for something you're not willing to give, you probably will not get it. Get it? Good. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for uh, <laughs> being patient with us when there's really no reason other than you love us. We're fallen people. We make mistakes. But you're always there, God. You're never expecting us to grovel, to crawl back. You just simply say to turn. That's what repent, turn to you. We turn to you today, God, with all of our weaknesses, things that we need to overcome, things that we need to change, not to satisfy you or pacify you, but to make our life better, to enhance the life that you've given to us here on earth. Thank you, Father, for such a great love. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want us to pray a prayer, a prayer of repentance, salvation. And I want you to, all of you to pray this, and don't whisper it. You say, but I'm saved. I don't need to pray this. I pray it twice every Sunday. Pray it with me. There are people that need our encouragement. They need to hear our voice we need to help them to not feel insecure about their prayer. So let's all pray this right now. Say, Father God, thank you so much for loving me so much that you gave your only son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you. I repent of my sin. I thank you, Lord, that I am now saved. Amen. Now, a religious person would say, well, that doesn't save you. I, you won't, we won't know you're saved. 
you don't have to prove one thing to me. I, I'm not the one that's going to say, well, you don't look saved, or maybe you're barely saved. That's not my job. That's not your job. Let that be God's job, because it is. And so if you prayed that prayer, watching online or the recorded version of this service, I want to ask you to text the word SAVED to 405-500-1310 right now. Text the word SAVED to 405-500-1310. And, and, and in a moment, our prayer team will be over to the left of the stage. I want you to come up and say, look, today I gave my life to Jesus, and I just want to ask you to pray for me that I'll be able to walk this out. Because that was always the hardest thing for me when I got born again. I had such high expectations of myself that I couldn't possibly achieve them. But I kept fighting, and I kept believing, and I was introduced to grace, and boy, that catapulted me to a place in God that no longer, uh, no fear no longer had a hold on me. I knew I was born again. I, I knew I made a lot of mistakes, and I still make my share. But I thank God for grace because that grace is empowering me and covering me, and he'll do the same for you. This time, I want to receive our tithes and offerings. Um, you can pick these, um, these door hangers up. There's some in the, at the information kiosk. You can pick these up at 